Her life was lived in the shadows. She'd lived this way as long as she could remember. She was born to a mother of dubious reputation, and she was raised not knowing which client might be her father. So she embraced a life of shadows at a very young age. I mean, after all, what choice did she have? It was the only life she knew. And she thrived in the shadows. She learned how to be pleasing to men, and so she profited from that knowledge. And, and uh, while the price was public scorn and shame and condemnation, she lived comfortably especially compared to many others of that day. Uh, she had a nest egg set aside, saved up for that day. See, the shadows were both her fortress and her prison. And from the shadows, she saw the world. She watched as the people went by, and she observed their lives, lives that she thought she would never know. And she judged those who judged her. She was privy to many secrets, an intimate observer of hypocrisies, and knowledgeable of, in, of events impacting her world. She was acutely aware of anything or anyone that threatened the safety of her shadows. And so it was with great interest that she followed these accounts of that would-be prophet, that supposed healer, that wannabe Messiah, this man from Nazareth called Jesus. She wanted to know, could someone like that be real? Her years in close contact with men had enabled her to quickly identify their weaknesses, their flaws, their motives. She knew from a glance what men wanted. She could look into their eyes and see the anger or the arrogance or the lust. And she thought to herself, if I can read a man's intentions with only a glance, then I can see through the facade of men playing religious games. I want to see this Jesus. I want to look into his eyes and I want to see if he really is different from other men. The problem is that she would have to leave the shadows to see him. So on that day when Jesus was coming to her village, she heard the crowds gathering, the people talking. And so she clothed herself in her very best public garments drew the cloak over her head and disappeared into the crowd, hoping, hoping that no one would identify this woman of the evening who was out in broad daylight. She moved carefully through the, the crowd, trying not to draw any attention to herself, and finally hid behind a group of women who were excitedly awaiting Jesus' arrival. And as she waited, she thought back through the countless faces of men who had used her and abused her and shamed her and condemned her. And she wanted to know, could there really be a man who was different? And then, and then she saw Jesus. Or more precisely, Jesus saw her. I mean, how could he see her? She, she was hidden in the crowd. She was a face among faces. She was a nobody. She was insignificant. And yet he saw her. It, it was like he was searching for her. Their eyes met. And she had intended to judge him. And yet it was like he was reading her. I mean, suddenly, she was exposed. Her life of the shadows was revealed for, for all of the broken, despairing hell that it was. And yet, she didn't feel condemned. She felt compassion. 
if that's what it was because it wasn't a part of her life. And maybe for the first time in her existence, she felt loved. Like Jesus desperately wanted to bless her, to heal her, to, to help her. She felt significant. I, I mean, she knew men, and she could read people, and she had never encountered anyone like Jesus. I, I, she didn't fully understand it, but deep down, she knew that everything had changed. Uh, in that moment, there was a, a mix of all these emotions. She wanted to shout. She wanted to cry. She wanted to dance. She wanted to laugh. She wanted to collapse. All from being in the presence of Jesus, but for a moment. And then she lost her mind. Forgetting about that beloved invisibility, she, she pushed through the crowd, and she ran back to her house, and, and she dug through her possessions, and she found her most precious gift an alabaster box and she tucked it into her robe and she headed back into the crowd oblivious to who would recognize her and she ran to catch up with Jesus and about the time that she got to where he was and and was fixing to push through the crowd she stopped suddenly and realized that he was entering the courtyard of a man named Simon who was a Pharisee a man who hated her and her kind, and wanted nothing more than to exterminate them. She paused, but the love that was welling up inside of her heart compelled her to go forward. And so she left the shadows for the final time, and she stepped into the spotlight in that courtyard, the courtyard of her nemesis. It was then that she recognized for the very first time that there were tears flowing down her face. And, and suddenly it was like the fountains broke loose. And all the pain and all the grief that had been stored up in her life like an ocean began to burst forth from her eyes. And she sobbed, healing, soul-cleansing sobs of grief. And without thinking about it, she fell down at the feet of Jesus. And she began to let this waterfall of tears wash over his feet. And she took her hair and she wiped the dirt and the grime off of his feet. And she began to kiss his feet. And then she did the unthinkable. She took out that alabaster box her life savings. And she broke it open and she poured the ointment out on Jesus. She barely heard the gasps around her from the crowd, the mutterings, the accusations. She was vaguely aware that Jesus and his host were having a conversation. She fully expected at any moment for angry voices and rough hands to grab her and throw her out. Or worse, have her executed. And she didn't care. She didn't care. For the first time in her life, she knew what it was to be loved and to be free. It wasn't angry words or rough hands that concluded this moment. It was Jesus. Jesus gently lifting her head until their eyes met once again. And in his eyes, she didn't see malice. She didn't see condemnation. She saw love. She saw mercy. She saw hope. And then he spoke the words that cauterized the pain and the failure of her past and gave her a fresh start. He said to her, woman, 
Your sins are forgiven. She thought, does he know me at all? Woman, your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. She took a breath. She got up. She wiped the tears away from her eyes. And she walked out of that courtyard boldly into a brand new life. The Gospel of Luke chapter 7 contains this story. Obviously, some of it uh, was mine. And I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 7. Uh, if you've got a Bible in the seats around you, it's page 1027. If you don't have a Bible or a Bible app, then grab one of these. 1027, you'll find Luke chapter 7. I want us to read this story because it's a story of transformation. It's a story of power. It's a story that, that if we let it into our lives will change us. Beginning in verse 36 of the Gospel of Luke chapter 7. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering him said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they both could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. And you did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little, loves little. And Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So when you read that story, who is it that you most relate to in the story? Now, I, I don't want you to answer that out loud. I really want you to wrestle with that question. I hope it kind of haunts you for a while. Who do you most relate to in that story? And by the way, let me give you a hint. The answer uh, that you're not going to give is Jesus. Okay, there's only one person who's Jesus, and that's Jesus. None of us really, you know, fit the bill after that. He's perfect. He's the Son of God. We're not. So, um, Aside from Jesus, who is it that you see yourself really connecting with in the story? And I want you to think about that while we examine two truths from this account. The first one is this. Religion labels people. Jesus loves people. Religion labels people. Jesus loves people. Look at verse 39 again. This one stands out to me. All this stuff is going on, and it says, Now when the Pharisee who had invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet... He would have known who and what sort of woman this is who was touching him, for she is a sinner. You see, the Pharisee, the Pharisees were the religious elite. They were the people who tried to follow God better than anybody else. Everyone considered them the holiest of the holy people uh, of, that, of that day and that time. The religious elite labeled the woman a sinner. But do you also notice he labeled Jesus not a prophet? 
He said, if this man were a prophet, he would know and, uh, that she's a tramp. And if she's a tramp, he would not let her touch him if he really was a holy man speaking for God. So obviously, he's not a prophet. Now, sin is what motivates us to label people, and our society loves labels. The culture we live in absolutely is enamored with labels because we use them all the time, and, and, uh, and they're just out there. Think about it. We label people as Democrats or Republicans. We label them as conservatives or liberals. We, we label people uh, as rich or poor and good and bad. Uh, we label people for all kinds of things, for education, for income, for accents, for their race, for their age, for their generation, for their hobbies, for their affiliations. We love labels. And you would think that the people of Jesus would do better. But we love labels too, don't we? Right? Because we got Baptists, and we got Catholics, and we got Lutherans, and we got Charismatics, and we got good and bad, and righteous and sinners, and addicts and adulterers, and angry and arrogant. And, and Jesus looks past the labels. Did, did you notice this? He looks past the labels. He didn't look at her as a sinner or as Simon as a Pharisee. He just looked past the labels, and he sees people, individuals, and he loves people. That means he loves us. That means that Jesus loves you. He sees us as lost sheep who need a shepherd. And Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. In other words, Jesus wants to find you and he wants to bring you into his family because he loves you. He died for you. He died for me. So we need to realize that labels divide and love unites us. Labels are always going to divide and love is always going to unite. You see, when we label people, we accentuate the differences. We focus on what separates us rather than what brings us together. And, and when we separate, what happens is uh, we put a label on somebody and we don't agree with them. And so we, we discount them as people. Oh, they're one of those people. So we discount them as people. And then not only do we discount, but sometimes we feel like we have to denigrate them. We have to talk trash about them. Wow, those people, you know, they're like this and this and this. And then we dehumanize them. And if you dehumanize somebody, if you denigrate somebody, if you discount somebody as a person because of a label, you know what you're not going to do to them? You're not going to love them. Because you're looking at the label. And love unites us. Now, I, I just confess, I grew up uh, a Baptist. All right? I was, I've been a Baptist since nine months before I was born. And... Uh, just part of my upbringing, and, and being brought up that way, I was taught to love Jesus, I was taught to read the Bible, great things, but I was also taught to judge other people, I was taught to label, and so if you weren't a Baptist, then you were suspect, you know, had a question, because we were right, and you were wrong, and that's just how it was, and, and, it, and you were especially wrong if you were Catholic, and, and they're, you know, the Catholics, they, they were all, all going to hell, all right, so I know, that's okay, because the Catholics felt that way about the Baptists, and, uh, but see, here's the thing. That, that's what I was taught. And, and here's the problem. They told me to read the Bible, and I did. And what I found in the Bible is that that's not what God does. He doesn't label people. And, and see, here's the other thing. is you start meeting people, and if you don't judge them, you actually listen to them. And I discovered there were a lot of people out there with different labels that love people just like I love people. And so, uh, you know, I grew up, became a pastor, and all that kind of stuff. And I thought, I like to freak people out. And and I met this great godly man, Father Chauncey, over at Our Lady of the Lake. And, uh, and he's a friend of mine, and he loves Jesus probably more than I do. And, uh, and, and he's just a great guy. And I said, hey, Chauncey, let's get our staffs together. You know, the people who serve at your church, people who serve at my church. Let's sit down together and freak them all out and, uh, and talk about, you know, pro, you know, church issues, stuff. And so we did that. We had lunch together one day, and, and it made some of their people uncomfortable because they never really sat down with Baptists and weren't sure what we were going to do to them. Uh, made, some of, made some of our staff uncomfortable because they were former Catholics, and they were kind of freaking out about this. And, um, and, we, and we sat down, we broke bread together, and, and we said, hey, here's what unites us. And we took this document called the Apostles' Creed, and uh, which is the earliest statement of faith from the early church fathers, probably dating back to the second century. 
and we said, hey, guess what? We agree with this. Go home and Google it. It's really great. Uh, it just says stuff like this. We believe in God the Father, creator of heaven and earth. Check. We believe in Jesus, his one and only son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, died on the cross to pay for our sins, uh, was raised from the dead, ascended to heaven, will come again to judge the living and the dead. Check. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Check. We believe in the one Catholic church. And you guys are going, wait a minute. That's little c Catholic. Catholic just means universal. Yeah, one church made up of all the people who love Jesus. Yep, check. We believe in the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins. Yeah. You see, we're in this together, and love unites us. It doesn't divide us. Labels divide us, and we're tempted as churches to label people. We're tempted as individuals to label people. Oh, those are good people, and these are bad people. Stay away from the bad people because we're the good people. You notice you never ever say they're the good people and we're the bad people? It's always us, good, them, bad. Here's the theological truth. <laughs> we're all bad. I know some of you are going, oh, everybody's good at, at their core. No, we're all bad. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. We all are lost and we need Jesus to find us. We're hopeless apart from Jesus. But the good news is we're all loved by God and valued by God and rescued by Jesus. So labels divide, love unites us, labels accuse, and love accepts. The Pharisee condemned the woman. She didn't live by his standards, his values, his beliefs. So he just accused her. She's a sinner. Jesus offers her acceptance. Now notice he didn't offer acceptance of her lifestyle, the choices that destroyed her and devalued her, but he accepted her as a person created by God, valued by God, loved by God. He wanted to set her free from the sin. So here's what I want you to know. God isn't afraid of your sin. He doesn't like the pain and destruction in your life. In fact, he grieves it, but God's not afraid of your sin. He wants to deliver you from it, set you free, heal your life, lead you to blessings. That's what he wants to do. He's not afraid of your sin because Jesus died to pay for your sin. All of it. Stuff in the past, the stuff of today, the stuff of tomorrow. When you love Jesus, he, he covers all your sins. So today, do you know that God loves you? Do you really know that God loves you? And I, when I say that, Get this, he doesn't just tolerate you. He, he doesn't accept you grudgingly into his family. It's not like, you know, God's up in heaven going, ah, crap, Garrison just confessed Jesus. I got to let him in now. Hey, do we have like a back room in the basement behind the boiler or something for him? No. Scripture says that, that all of heaven rejoices when one of us confesses Jesus, when one of us repents. All of heaven throws a party. God is excited that you are part of his family. He loves you. But here's what I've come to realize. People can't really grasp the love of God unless they experience the love of God's people. Does that make sense? People really don't get the love of God unless they experience the love of God from God's people. And I want Calvary to be a place where people are loved. So are you loving people or labeling people? Second truth I want to share with you from this story is that gratitude flows from mercy that is received. When we're aware of God's grace for us, it just results in a life of gratitude. And Jesus tells this powerful little parable about two debtors to Simon the Pharisee. He says, hey, Simon, the one guy owed a, a man 50 denarii. The other guy owes him 500 denarii. doesn't matter how much a denarii is worth. You get the difference. Neither one could pay. The guy forgave both their debts. Which one loves him more? So which one loves him more? That's not a quick trick question. Even Simon the Pharisee got it right. So which one loves him more? Yeah, the one who got forgiven more, right? So here's the principle. The one who's forgiven little loves little. 
And the one who's forgiven much loves? Yeah. Simon the Pharisee completely disrespected Jesus. Okay, he invited Jesus to come to his house, and then he treated him with disrespect. How so? Jesus describes this to Simon in the conversation. Simon, I came into your house. You gave me no water for my feet. It was common courtesy when you invited a guest in because the roads were all dirt that you gave them water for them to wash their feet, or better yet, you had a servant wash their feet. Simon didn't do that to Jesus. It was also common courtesy to anoint their head with oil. Why? Because they're all nasty and dirty and gross, and that is a way to refresh. Kind of like after you spent the night on an airplane and they come by and give you a hot towel. It's sort of like saying, you look like crap, but here, this will make you feel better. It's just kind of common courtesy. He didn't do that. He didn't give Jesus a kiss. And there's a lot of guys in here going, they're going I'm not going to somebody's house that's going to try and kiss me. That's just weird. Okay, yeah, it's a different culture. In that culture, when, when a guest came into your house, a kiss from the host was a way of saying, I respect you. You are welcome and valued here. Kind of like you getting up off the couch and shaking their hand and saying, hey, good to see you. Glad you're here. Simon didn't do any of those things. Why? Because Simon the Pharisee believed himself a righteous man that God was fortunate to have on his side. He was a good guy, and he was inviting Jesus there to see if Jesus was a good guy. The woman believed she was unworthy, a sinner beyond forgiveness. So the Pharisee didn't love much because he was unaware of his desperate need for mercy. The woman loved much because of her great sin and her tremendous need for mercy. So which one captures your attitude a little bit better? God is lucky that I'm on his team because I bring talents and gifts and resources? Or I am blessed to be on God's team. It's a privilege to serve him. Thank you, God, for allowing me to be in your family. You see, one is an attitude of pride and the other is an attitude of humility. And Scripture tells us that God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. You see, the truth is, I know that I don't deserve to stand here and share this truth with you. I don't deserve to be your pastor. I don't deserve to lead a church like this. I don't deserve to speak for God at all. It is only by the mercy of God that I am able to do this, period. And so I am grateful. I am grateful that, that I deserve hell, but I'm going to get heaven. All because of God's mercy. I am grateful that I get to, to lead a church like this. I, I get to share the truth like this. I am grateful that I have more blessings in my life than I deserve. You see, gratitude flows from mercy received. So today, are you aware of your sin? Are you aware of your sin? And, and uh, what I've come to realize is most people are really aware of the failures in their life except for two kinds of people, religious people and good people. Religious people aren't aware of their sin because they're too busy looking at other people's sin and pointing those out. And they don't often look in the mirror and go, wow, that's me. Good people are, are too busy banking on the fact that in their estimation, they're okay because they're doing a few good things and they're hoping it's enough to get them into heaven and they don't really want to stop and look at the, at the bad stuff. So are you aware of your sin today? Are you living in grace today? In other words, have you experienced the life-changing forgiveness of Jesus? In your spiritual life, have you had one of those moments where it felt like you were looking into the eyes of Jesus and you heard him say to you, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. And then, does gratitude erupt from your life? What, what role does gratitude play in your life? Is it something that's just spontaneously, unprompted, flowing out of you naturally all the time? Or do you need to be prompted? Do you need to be encouraged to express your gratitude? And if you're not sure where you are in gratitude, ask the people who live in your life with you. 
Because if you're complaining and griping and whining all the time, gratitude probably isn't present. So who do you relate to the most in this story? Is it the self-righteous, disrespectful, religious guy? Or is it the desperate, broken whore? Let me put it another way. Are you loving little? Or are you loving much? Because Jesus loves you completely. Pray with me.